Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I thought I would start by reading a little bit from the book um, as a jumping up, jumping off point. And the chapter I thought some of you may know that I, anyone who's read it will know that I structured the book according to uh, eight principles that your grandmother would have considered common sense and which are now considered astonishingly controversial. Um, the eight principles are sex must be taken seriously. Men and women are different. Some desires are bad. Loveless sex is not empowering. Consent is not enough. Violence is not love. People are not products. Marriage is good. So fiery stuff, as you can tell. Um, I thought that I would go straight to chapter eight, and I'll tell you that this is the chapter that probably actually proved to be the most controversial in the sense that um, I've had a lot of different groups reading the book and, um, and uh, paying interest in my work, um, including um, social conservatives, religious groups of all kinds, and also uh, secular, some secular progressives and feminists. And the secular progressives and feminists found this chapter difficult. Um, as, may, as may be apparent, because I think it's one of those points where actually there are a lot of issues, pornography, um, prostitution, that many feminists and social conservatives are aligned on entirely. Um, and marriage is, I think, a point where you, you hit some divergence. So anyway, we'll, let's dive into this discussion of marriage, because I think that will be, uh, I'm hoping that's a Just leave it. Just get really clear. Okay. All right. Go right on top of it. I'm securing my vision. <laughs> All right. Chapter eight. Marriage is good. In making the case against the sexual revolution, I've often run across a particular kind of problem that is by no means unique to this subject. I call it the problem of normal distribution. The normal distribution is also known as the bell curve because the graph it produces looks rather like a bell. It is a continuous probability distribution that is symmetrical around the mean, meaning, in essence, that most of the data points cluster around the middle, and the further a value is from the mean, the less likely it is to occur. The normal distribution is found again and again in the sciences. The sizes of snowflakes, lifetimes of light bulbs, and milk production of cows are all normally distributed. So are human physical traits, such as height, shoe size, and birth weight. Social phenomena are a little more complicated, but even so, the normal distribution is often a good approximation for what we see across human populations. Sociosexuality, for instance, that is an interest in sexual variety, is close to being normally distributed. Most people are close to average, and a minority of unusual people are found at one or other pole, meaning that there are some people who have no interest whatsoever in casual sex, and some people who are off the charts. Importantly, though, the bell curves for men and for women are somewhat different, and the male mean, with the male mean further towards the higher end of the sociosexuality spectrum. The problem of normal distribution is this. When you impose some change on a population, different people will experience it differently. It is very, very difficult to design a policy that will hone in on just one group of people at just one point on the graph, leaving the rest of the curve unchanged. And when it comes to a big historical event such as the sexual revolution, which nobody designed or even fully foresaw, that imprecision is even more marked. Marital satisfaction is almost normally distributed. Most people report being quite happy in their marriages, with a minority who report being very happy and another minority who report being very unhappy. It used to be exceptionally difficult for those very unhappy couples to divorce. Journalist Megan McArdle describes the process of acquiring a divorce in 19th century America. She writes, It took years, was expensive, and required proving that your spouse had abandoned you for an extended period with no financial support. Was, if male, not merely discreetly dallying, but flagrantly carrying on. Or was not just belting you once now and again when you got mouthy, but routinely pummeling you to within an inch of your life. After you got divorced, you were a pariah in all but the largest cities. 
If you were a desperately wronged woman, you might change your name, taking your maiden name as your first and continuing to use your husband's last name to indicate that you expected to continue living as if you were married, i.e. chastely, and expect to have some limited intercourse with your neighbours, though of course you would not be invited to events held in a church or evening affairs. Financially secure women generally, and I'm not making this up, move to Europe. Edith Wharton, who moved to Paris when she got divorced, wrote moving stories about the way divorced women were shunned at home. If you sought a divorce during this period, it was almost certainly because you were at the very unhappy tail of the normal distribution. And thus, and I don't think this is a controversial statement, deserving of help and sympathy. That was certainly the attitude of the social reformers who began to campaign for the liberalisation of divorce laws in the years following the Second World War. From roughly the 1960s onwards and across the Western world, it suddenly became much easier to get divorced. And people who had been legally trapped in hellish marriages were freed from them, which was a good thing. But then came the problem of normal distribution. In reading the parliamentary debates on what would become the 1969 Divorce Reform Act, the key piece of liberalising legislation in the UK, it does not appear that the supporters of the bill knew what was coming. They believed that their reforms would be an act of kindness towards the small number of people on the unhappy tail of the normal distribution, but that the rest of the curve would be left intact. This bill does not open the door to Lord Stowhill, one-time Attorney General. That door is wide open now under the existing law, and it would be hard to open it wider. And yet open it did. In the decade following the Divorce Reform Act, the number of divorces trebled and then kept rising, peaking in the 1980s. Since then, there has been a slight decline in the divorce rate, not because of a genuine return to marital longevity, but rather because you can't get divorced if you don't get married, and marriage rates are at an historic low. In 1968, 8% of children were born to parents who were not married. In 2019, it was almost half. Today, there are just two marriages for every divorce in the UK each year. The institution of marriage, as it once was, is now more or less dead. In the United States, it is deader still. There, almost half of marriages end in divorce, and there is also a new and significant class divide. Before the 1970s, the vast majority of Americans got married and stayed married, regardless of family income. Now, of those Americans in the top third income bracket, 64% are in an intact marriage, meaning they have only married once and are still in their first marriage. In contrast, only 24% of Americans in the lowest third income bracket are in an intact marriage. A durable marriage is fast becoming a luxury of the upper classes. Of course, some marriages should end, and in those cases, the liberalisation of divorce laws was a blessing. Although married women are not at greater risk of domestic violence than unmarried women, the opposite, in fact, it is obviously better when abused wives do not face serious legal obstacles in trying to leave their husbands. The extreme unhappy tale of the normal distribution really did need to get divorced, and before the reforms of the mid-20th century, they often couldn't. But the problem of normal distribution made it impossible for the reforms to laser in on just the extreme cases. Most modern divorces are not a consequence of domestic abuse. Most involve a couple growing apart, falling out of love and trying for a fresh start. But in many of these cases, the promise of happier alternative relationships remains unfulfilled, particularly for women, who are, most li who are more likely than men to remain permanently single following divorce. What's more, between a third and a half of divorced people in the UK report in surveys that they regret their decision to divorce to divorce, excuse me. There is a lot of space between happy and irreparably unhappy. In the past, those people remained married. Now they usually don't. And in a culture of high divorce rates, even those marriages that, that last risk being undermined. When marriage vows are no longer truly binding, couples seem to become less confident in their relationships. One study by the American economist Betsy Stevenson, for instance, found that marital investment declined in the wake of no-fault divorce laws, with newlywed couples in states that passed no-fault divorce about 10% less likely to support a spouse through college or graduate school, or graduate school, excuse me, and 6% less likely to have a child together. When marriage became impermanent, the institution as a whole was changed, and with it much else. I doubt very much that any of the well-meaning reformers of the 1960s 
ever envisaged such an outcome. Their intention had been a noble one, to offer a way out for people stuck in wretched marriages and to lift the stigma from the then tiny minority unfortunate enough to have been through divorce. But the problem of normal distribution interceded. There was always a threshold of dysfunction above which a marriage was considered beyond saving and reformers intended to nudge it only a little. But as the marginal divorce became but as the marginal divorce made the next one more likely, and the one after that more likely still, that threshold went hurtling downwards at great speed. I just had a sip of water one minute. I wrote this book to argue in particular against a progressive narrative of the sexual revolution which has become extraordinarily mainstream. This narrative says that uh, the sexual revolution was done by and for women, and, there has been, and that it has been of great benefit for women, and that we should understand it unambiguously as a sign of progress. So this is, of course, part of a, a whole historical approach to the history of humanity, where um, everything is plotted upon an, a linear line and everything gets better all the time. You know, this arc of the moral universe bending towards justice, the Martin Luther King Jr. phrase, which Barack Obama liked so much he had it embroidered into the Oval Office rug. That is the guiding philosophy of our times. And you notice actually how difficult it is to remove words like progress from your own vocabulary. It is such an appealing way of, de of describing anything being good. You know, we, we plot it onto that graph, even those of us who are um, critical of the model. And the sexual revolution is a classic example of that progress narrative in action. The problem with the progress narrative is um, twofold. One is that it makes it very difficult to be critical of anything new. The assumption is that if something is new, it must necessarily be better. And to say otherwise is assumed to be rejecting the entire progress model, which is a heretical thing to do. The other problem with the progress narrative is that it builds in the assumption not only that old ideas are bad, but also that older people are bad, actually. That there is something suspect about the, the beliefs, the worldviews of anyone born, I mean, more than five minutes ago, really, in practice. It's not even, you know, I, I, I'm constantly um, observing in um, progressive media articles about, say, sitcoms or comedies or whatever sort of uh, instances of pop culture made even a decade ago, 20 years ago, which are now condemned as problematic. It's built into the, to the model that old things must be constantly rejected and renewed because of this kind of forward thrust of history that we're supposed to subscribe to. So I wrote this book as a, as a critique of that, and in particular as a uh, a feminist critique of that to say, and I'm using feminist in, in a loose sense here, to mean a, I'm using it to mean an ideology that is concerned with the interests of women qua women. And I would say that anyone concerned with the interests of women qua women um, should be highly critical of the sexual revolution. Although I should add that I don't think that that means that all men have benefited from the sexual revolution, far from it. I would say maybe a small minority of men have, although it's a somewhat superficial win. Um, and I also definitely don't think that it's been in the interest of children. And actually, if we were to, um, to make a final judgment on who has won from the sexual revolution, has it been men, has it been women, I think the only thing that we could conclusively decide is that women, uh, children have lost from the sexual revolution. And nowhere, I think, is that more apparent that when it comes to the question of marriage, um, I go on in that chapter to describe at length all the ways in which um, having a, a stable marriage is of benefit, not only to husbands and wives, but even more so to children. One of the most robust findings in social sciences, for instance, is um, a phenomenon known darkly as the Cinderella effect. That is the finding that uh, a step-parent is more likely to abuse a child um, by a factor of about 100. 
Mostly in practice that means stepfathers because it's generally stepfathers who are entering a child's home because mothers are more likely to retain custody. It also applies to stepmothers and it's worth pausing to reflect on the fact that the reason that we are able to use the term Cinderella to describe this phenomenon is that it is in a sense um, as old as the hills. You know, that we have this baked into fairy tales um, to sound like Jordan Peterson for a moment because, because fairy tales are expressive of deep, profound truths. That are sh the reason they survive as stories is, beca is because people are attracted to them, they feel them to be true. And Cinderella is obviously one example of that. And uh, the malevolent presence of the step, and the step parent, the stepmother in that case, is a consequence of bereavement. Until very recently, the reason why people had blended families, as we'd now call them, was not because of divorce, it was because of parental death. And there probably were as many step parents and stepchildren as there are now. It's just that the reason the reason for those families coming into existence was because of very high mortality, which we fortunately now don't have, don't suffer from. You know that is, I'm not a I'm not a progressive in the sense that I'm a well I'm a progress apostate, but that doesn't mean that I don't think some things get better. You know it is clearly the case that something like um, mortality rates have improved as a consequence of, of modern medical technology, and that's a great blessing. The difference, though, between our blended families of the 21st century and the blended families of um, the people who, who compose the Cinderella fairy tale um, is that we've done it by choice. We haven't done it as a consequence of parental death. We've done it because we have permitted the development of a culture of divorce and the death of the institution of marriage. And you know, as I say, and as I, 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 it's not just throat clearing, I really do mean it, you know, there are some beneficiaries of that. History is very complicated. And I think a fundamentally conservative insight is the recognition that everything has trade-offs, particularly when it comes to enormous historical events, which, you know, as I've, as I've just said, nobody, nobody designed um, or even fully foresaw. The progress narrative is, is nonsense to think that anything that enormous could have unambiguously positive consequences. It clearly hasn't. Um, it's also true to say that it is, the, the, you know, like anything, there are winners and losers. And there are some people who have benefited from divorce becoming very much easier. The problem is, I think, with seeing that as a Society is greater than the sum of its parts. There's another conservative insight. And so the argument from divorce reformers of the 1960s and those who still support a culture of divorce and see it as a, um, a blessing that people now have more individual freedom to determine their life futures is that people don't actually operate as individuals. To understand society as us, us individuals all sort of bumping into each other like atoms um, is to fundamentally misunderstand how human beings operate. We are social creatures and um, sex is relational, marriage is relational, parenthood is relational. I start from chapter two saying that men and women are different. And there are lots of ways in which men and women are different. I don't cover them all in this book. <laughs> I know, it's, it's how obvious, right? But <laughs> I mean, this, need, this needs to be litigated though, unfortunately. Um, men and women are different on a physical level. Only women can get pregnant. Um, that will always remain true. Only women can get pregnant. Um, men are also substantially bigger and stronger than women, probably by um, a, a more than um, most people realize. Um, not anyone in the armed forces, I'm sure they're completely aware of this because they have to confront reality on a regular basis. But it is, it is incredibly easy, actually, in the contemporary West to not realise quite how profound differences are between men and women because if you, say, do a laptop job where you're not using, using your body um, day to day, if you maybe have a small family, you've never had siblings with whom you, you play fought um, as children or as adolescents, crucially, I mean, it's... Children, boys and girls can play fight on a fairly even, even playing field. It's once they hit adolescence, adolescence that testosterone kicks in and then all of a sudden your brother beats you every time. 
people, you know, people in small families might not might not know that. Um, the birth control pill allows women to suspend fertility sometimes permanently, um, which means that you can you, it, it gives a an illusion of reproductive sameness between men and women. It gives the illusion that sex is consequence free, although of course it isn't. Um, all of these factors allow us to kid ourselves that men and women are essentially the same on a physical level and indeed on a psychological level. Now the psychological differences are more um, tricky because they are average differences and there are outliers in every direction and we all know people who are, I don't know, um, unusually uh, masculine or feminine relative to their sexes. And furthermore, I don't think anyone is just a bundle of gender stereotypes. You know, we, we all diverge psychologically in all sorts of ways. Um, but the psychological differences do exist on all sorts of things. And particularly when it comes to sexuality, the, the two bell curves that I described, you know, the two overlapping bell curves are um, um, the most, uh, possibly the most important sort of mathematical model in social sciences. It means that um, at the population level, men and women are profoundly different from one another, which means that if you're trying to apply some, some law, some social norm, some enormous social revolution, you should expect that to have different effects on men and women. So for instance, if you are going to um, destigmatize casual sex, if you're going to encourage people to um, uh, have imitate Hugh Hefner, in your lifestyle, essentially, there are going to be more men on average who welcome that opportunity than women. And the nature of sex being relational is that um, uh, women must be found to serve that demand, essentially. And I think that what we've seen over the last 70 years or so has been the mass encouragement by culture and by the material conditions brought on by the pill to encourage young women to behave more like men in every way, really, but particularly when it comes to sexuality. Um, and that, as far as I can tell from speaking to women and reading polling and so on, is making these young women profoundly miserable. Sometimes with a, you know, a layer of, um, of, uh, a layer of confidence, a, a sort of outward acceptance of the narrative that actually having sex like a man is liberatory, but I find to scratch the surface and there's normally a great deal of pain behind that, that um, sort of bombastic attitude. And I've met and spoken to so many women who have gone from uh, sort of youthful reveling in sexual liberation, so-called, only to later realize how much harm it did them and how miserable they were made by it. I have never met a woman who has traveled in the opposite direction. This is, I would say, the whole basis of the function of marriage, is the recognition that society is greater than the sum of its parts, that we are not atoms bumping into one another, and particularly that mothers and children are not just atoms bumping into one another. One of the um, things that I have written in the book and have said in many interviews since, which people find very surprising, is, um, Mothers and infants are not actually individuals. Not only because of the very strong biological bond, a biological bond that you can lessen to some extent. You know, you can, you can use infant formula, you can use daycare. We have the means now, to some extent, to um, tug mothers and infants further away from each other on a biological level. But there's an emotional level as well. The number of women that I have spoken to who have talked about that first time they leave the house or, or spend a short period of time away from their baby, who say it felt like losing a limb. That's always the expression. This was, and it was exactly what I experienced as well. I wrote this book while pregnant, which wasn't a very good idea, but anyway. Um, and so I experienced this, you know, firsthand. And um, the idea of understanding a helpless in infant as an individual and of applying a political ideology like liberal individualism to an infant um, is nonsense. Infants are entirely reliant on adult care to stay alive, moment to moment. 
and it, in the overwhelming majority of cases, that care is primarily going to be provided by a mother, which therefore means that that mother cannot really be understood as an individual either. Um, my friend, the writer Mary Harrington, author of another recent book, which you should all read, called Feminism Against Progress, um, she says at the moment for her that she really um, woke up to the recognition of this truth was when she had her own little baby and was woken in the night by her baby crying to be fed, to be breastfed. And she thought, well, I suppose according to um, uh, liberal individualism, I could just say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in bed. I'm going to exercise my freedom as an individual and, uh, and say, no, I'd rather have sleep, actually. <laughs> You're on your own, honey, you know? But of course, not only would that be you know, not only would that be a cruel thing to do to her baby, but it's almost physically impossible not to do that. The, the, the effect on the maternal body of an infant's cries, particularly an infant crying to be fed by you, um, is impossible to resist. To think that those two, two, two beings, in that case, are just atoms bumping into one another, you know, making free choices about whether or not they, um, they uh, sort of honour obligations to one another. It's nonsense. So if we start from the recognition there, okay, that actually mothers and infants aren't really individuals, then we have to start thinking about what it is that mothers and infants need in order to flourish, in order to, to, to survive in the base, most basic sense. Um, mothers cannot participate in the labour market for at least some period of time around matrescence. Um, when heavily pregnant, after giving birth, and so on. Um, women can't operate in that moment like the liberal individualist subject that we're supposed to. They need to be provided for by somebody. And this question of who that somebody should be is a long-standing problem within feminism because um, the historical answer to this in pretty much every culture that we know of is for women to be provided for through a combination of their husbands and their extended families. And the fact that they must be provided for by those people within their close orbit therefore provides very clear justification for why the people in their close orbit would pay very close attention to their sexual behaviour. Because actually when you become in, a, in conditions of scarcity where you don't have a state, you don't have free daycare, I mean, not that we have free daycare, right, but you don't have any kind of social safety net available, um, it suddenly becomes, becomes the business of the family and the community whether or not children are brought into the world and whether or not those children are considered legitimate. That whole basis, therefore, of, um, of marriage, of the taboo on premarital sex, on the family playing close interest into matchmaking and who pairs off with whom and so on, traditionally viewed um, by most feminists as an example of the, the, the oppression of women and of the suppression of female sexuality, which it is, okay, but actually it's also the suppression of absolutely everyone's sexuality, and particularly of men's. I mean, the whole, the whole point of that infrastructure, that social infrastructure buttressed by religion, buttressed by the state, is to, um, is to regulate heterosexuality, which means regulating reproduction, who comes into the world, whose responsibility are, are these children. It's a way of understanding reproduction on a collective level, not on this atomized bumping into each other, whatever model. And many feminists have looked at this and they have said, you know, quite fairly that sometimes the system fails. And sometimes you end up with women being stuck with abusive husbands or being coerced by their families into unwanted matches, unwanted children. All of that is true. It does fail. Every Every human phenomenon we know of fails to some extent. The question is, what is our alternative? And the only alternative that really is substantially offered, well, no, that, that's not true. There are, two, there are two options that have generally been offered by other feminists. Non-reactionary feminists, that's the term that Mary Harrington uses to describe us as a tongue-in-cheek term, but is um, either you don't have children at all, that's a pretty popular option if we're to look at birth rates, right? Um, to uh, a common common feminist view is to say, well, if 
childbearing limits the freedom of women, which it does. I think that's true. And one of my friends who had a baby a little, a little while after me, her first baby, said that um, the only thing that limits your freedom more than having a baby is going to prison. <laughs> which is true, which is true. Um, if, we, if we hold to an ideology that considers that to be intolerable, that considers the, the freedom of the human individual to be the, the highest virtue, then when faced with choosing between having children and being free, well, I guess the children have got to go, right? That, that is, a, that is a, a very strong thread within feminism and continues to be. Um, my next book is going to be called The Case for Having Kids. And um, I kind of got away with this one. I'm not sure if I'm going to get away with the next one. Um, <laughs> because actually it's, more, it's actually a more explosive yeah. argument um, than this one to say that actually the, the, the radical infringement on your freedom presented by uh, parenthood, and I think by motherhood more, more so than fatherhood because of the physical burdens on women, um, is one that we should embrace. That's a very countercultural thing to say. Um, <laughs> um, the other option that has at times been offered by feminism is to say that um, this should be the state's responsibility, is to basically scale up that community, um, that network of community support for the child. This is say, um, you don't have to be just supported by your, your husband, your family. You, you can be supported by, by the state, by the collective, by millions of taxpayers that you don't know. Um, which means in practice, um, normally that care being delivered by um, individuals in the employ of the state. So, for instance, the um, universal daycare proposal, which has been sort of kicked around in feminist circles for many decades, would basically mean that you could, at any moment, any time of day, any age of infant, deliver your child into the care of a kind of rotating cast of um, generally poor, often migrant women employed by the state, um, and that this would be paid for by taxpayers. I, I, I don't entirely reject the argument that the state should, to some extent, well, I think the state should be certainly providing an awful lot more support for families than it currently does. Um, the state basically doesn't think my son exists, right, from a, from a, because he's too young to go to school. So from a taxpaying perspective, you know, we, I am taxed as an individual, my husband is taxed as an individual. If um, in, stay, in, in families with stay-at-home parents, normally stay-at-home mothers, there is a financial penalty in this country as a consequence of our tax system. Um, we, uh, I mean, apart from child benefit and a handful of other, um, handful of other benefits which have a very sharp cutoff point um, with, uh, in terms of income, not true for most other state services, the, the, the government basically doesn't recognize the existence of little children in a financial sense. So I don't think, I think that actually it is, in, it is in the interest of the government to recognize the existence of little children and to support families. The question is how should that support be provided? And my, my argument against the universal daycare proposal is that actually little children, children of all ages, but little children in particular, those first crucial hundred weeks of a little child's life, do not consider their caregivers to be fungible, basically. They, they do not feel equally soothed by a rotating cast of paid employees as they do by their own mother or, or their own father or their own grandmother or some other stable figure in their lives. This is not to say that it means that it's all one mum, you know, the kind of really extreme version of attachment parenting where you have to be entirely self-sacrificing at all times. It is, it is natural in our, in our species history to have allo parents, to have a sort of group of loving adults working in concert around a child in order to support them. Um, I was reading some interesting research recently about how hunter-gatherers parent. You know, bear in mind that we spent 95% of our species history as hunter-gatherers, so it's uh, our first and most successful adaptation as a species. We should really understand modernity as a you know, the last five minutes, right, in our evolutionary history, and our brains have not caught up. This is a very important insight, right? Our brains have not caught up with the enormous material changes that we've seen um, in the last several centuries, let alone the last few decades. And the way that hunter-gatherers parent is that there are lots of people related to each other around the child at all times, 
and um, there, this study, I, I wish I could remember the numbers off the top of my head, but they, they counted the number of times that a child changes hands within an hour. And the child is basically constantly changing hands between different, normally different female kin. Um, that is our kind of normal parenting environment. And I think that the, um, the evident fragility of the family and of marriage is rooted in the fact that we are attempting incredibly experimental things with mothers and children. We have not taken as our kind of basis of political analysis the recognition that actually mothers and infants come as a package and that therefore means as well that there are a whole load of other people who also come as a package and that actually we need to be thinking not in terms of atoms bumping into one another but of concentric circles fitting within one another. I don't think that the, the feminist analysis that either demands that we just forego having children altogether or that demands that the state tries to replicate what the family has historically replicated, I don't think either of those are going to work. And so my conclusion that marriage is actually good for women, my feminist case for marriage, is based on the recognition that actually it is the only model that has so far worked. <laughs> With all of its failings, right? With all of the many examples that anyone can, anyone can, can sort of present to me of people um, behaving terribly towards one another. It is the only model, the monogamous marriage model is the only model that has, that has proved itself capable of protecting children from, say, the abuse of step-parents, protecting mothers from the, 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 the poverty and isolation that comes from not being supported during those crucial, crucial months and years when you can't participate in the labour market in a normal way. I say a normal way, that's so crazy. The, the normal life process, actually, I mean, the, what ought to happen if we don't have the pill available to us is that we spend a short, we, we are born completely helpless infants who are reliant on the loving care of adults. We eventually become uh, young adults who no longer rely on anyone else for care and, no longer ha and don't have to give out care ourselves because we don't yet have children. That is a blip. That is a short period of your life where you are neither dependent nor looking after dependents. Um, because what would normally happen is you then have your own children and you care for them and then when you reach old age, they care for you and you are constantly in some kind of relationship, some kind of dependent relationship with people close to you in your... In your in what the pill has done and what to some extent um, the state has done is it has artificially extended that period of relative auto or, or, autonomous, that's not the word, autonomy. It has falsely extended that and has given us the, therefore the false impression that that is a human norm. That is not the human norm. The human norm is to be dependent and to have others be dependent on us. And the only model that we have yet found which seems to defend the dependent is the monogamous marriage model. And it is, as a right, <laughs> you know, enormously under threat and not, sadly, supported um, in policy in the way that it ought to, not supported in culture in the way that it ought to be. Um, and uh, my, my humble effort in this book is to try and make an argument that actually marriage is worthy of protection and that it has a way of reinventing itself. And I'm just going to end the last few minutes by writing, by reading out the bit. Yes, here we go. The reinvention of marriage. I've written earlier in this book about what I've called the cad and dad modes of male sexuality, with the former orientated towards casual sex and the latter towards commitment. Although there are some men who are innately and resolutely focused on one or other of these modes, it's far more common for men to sit somewhere in the middle, moving between the two depending on their age and social context. Having almost reached the end of this book, I hope I've managed to persuade you that the CAD mode of male sexuality is bad for women en masse. The vast majority of women find it difficult to detach emotion from sex, meaning that an encounter with a CAD who doesn't call is likely to leave a woman feeling distressed, even if she attempts to repress those feelings. 
women did not evolve to treat sex as meaningless, and trying to pretend otherwise does not end well. Then there are the physical consequences of sex, which are inherently asymmetrical, with the danger and pain of an unwanted pregnancy borne entirely by the woman. Modern forms of contraception are mostly effective, enough at least, to have transformed sexual relations in the post-1960s era, but they still regularly fail. And whatever you think about the ethical status of the fetus, we should all be able to agree that an abortion is not a good thing for a woman to go through, given such medical risks as uterine damage or sepsis, not to mention the emotional consequences, which are not trivial. All in all, attempting to mimic the CAD mode of male sexuality, as liberal feminism encourages, does not constitute liberation for women. The Hugh Hefners of the world do not quail at the thought of a sexually liberated womankind, quite the opposite, in fact. They are delighted to find themselves with a buffet of young women to feast on, all of them appalling, apparently willing to suffer their mistreatment without complaint. Looked at in the starkest terms, I can't help but agree with the dark pronouncement my grandmother made when I told her about the thesis of this book, Women Have Been Conned. The task for practically minded feminists then is to deter men from CAD mode. Our current sexual culture does not do that, but it could. In order to change the incentive structure, we would need a technology that discourages short-termism in male sexual behavior, protects the economic interests of mothers, and creates a stable environment for the raising of children. And we do already have such a technology, even if it is old, clunky, and prone to periodic failure. It's called monogamous marriage. Before I start sounding too quixotic, I should make one thing clear. Lifelong monogamy is not our natural state. Only about 15% of societies in the anthropological record have been monogamous. Monogamy has to be enforced through laws and customs, and even within societies in which it is deeply embedded, plenty of people are defiant. To date, monogamy has been dominant in only two types of society, small-scale groups beset by serious environmental privation, and some of the most complex civilizations to have ever existed, including our own. Almost all others have been polygynous, permitting high-status men to take multiple wives. But while the monogamous marriage model may be relatively unusual, it is also spectacularly successful. When monogamy is imposed on a society, it tends to become richer. It has lower rates of both child abuse and domestic violence, since conflict between co-wives tends to generate both. Birth rates and crime rates both fall, which encourages economic development, and wealthy men deny the opportunity to devote their resources to acquiring more wives, instead invest elsewhere in property, businesses, employees, and other productive endeavors. This is, it seems, the solution to what anthropologists have called the puzzle of monogamous marriage. How is it that a marriage system that does not suit the interests of the most powerful members of society, high status men, has nevertheless come to be institutionalized across so much of the world? The answer is that although monogamy is less satisfactory for these men, it produces wealthy, stable societies that survive. A monogamous marriage system is successful in part because it pushes men away from CAD mode, particularly when premarital sex is also prohibited. Under these circumstances, if a man wants to have sex in a way that's socially acceptable, he has to make himself marriageable, which means holding down a good job and setting up a household suitable for the raising of children. He has to tame himself, in other words. Fatherhood then has a further taming effect, even at the biochemical level. When men are involved in the care of their young children, their testosterone levels drop, alongside their aggression and sex drive. A society composed of tamed men is a better society to live in, for men, for women, and for children. The monogamous marriage model is also the best solution yet discovered to the problems presented by child rearing. There was a wisdom to the traditional model in which the father was primarily responsible for earning money, while the mother was primarily responsible for caring for children at home. Such a model allows mothers and children to be physically together and at the same time financially supported. In an age of labor-saving devices, such as washing machines and gas boilers, it has become less time-consuming to run a household and thus more feasible for mothers of young children to do paid work outside of the home, as most of us do. But attempting to play the traditional roles of mother and father simultaneously, as single mothers are forced to do, is close to impossible. For some women, paid work outside the home is a joy and a privilege. For many more, it is a responsibility and often an onerous one. Even those women who enjoy their work are physically incapable of performing it during the early months of a baby's life. 
I should know. I began this book at the beginning of my pregnancy and completed it when my son was six months old. Writing is probably one of the easiest jobs to combine with motherhood, but even so, there were weeks on end during which I didn't write a word because I was too busy caring for my baby. And while I could be practically supported by other people, including my husband, I was irreplaceable as mother, not only because I was the only person who could breastfeed, but also because children have a relationship with their mothers that starts from conception. And that relationship cannot be handed over without distress to both mother and baby. If we want to keep that maternal bond intact, then the only solution is for another person to step in during these times of vulnerability and do the tasks needed to keep a household warm and fed. Perhaps we could call that person a spouse. Perhaps we could call her legal and emotional bond a marriage. Marriage is an institution that has a way of reinventing itself. In 2020, an initiative set up by a group of American students called the Affirmative Consent Project began marketing a consent kit available online for $2.99. This pocket-sized kit contained a condom, two breath mints, and a contract stating that the undersigned had agreed to have sex. Couples were encouraged to take a photo of themselves holding the signed piece of paper. Why not invite family and friends to witness the signing, some wags asked. Why not hire a professional photographer? Dress up, make an event of it. Similarly, in 2021, the journalist Julia Yofe was among the many feminists who responded to the introduction of new restrictions on abortion rights in Texas by suggesting that men ought to be compelled to provide financial support to their sexual partners if they became pregnant. Yoffe tweeted, apparently expecting conservatives to be outraged by this extremely conservative proposal, if you are anti-choice and you want to make sure women carry every pregnancy to term, why not make the person who created the pregnancy contribute? Why not have men pay child support to the women they impregnate? Why not indeed? I have just one piece of advice to, step, to offer in this chapter, and you probably already guessed what it will be. So here it is. Get married and do your best to stay married particularly if you have children, and particularly if those children are still young. And if you do find yourself in the position of being a single mother, wait until your children are older before you bring a stepfather into their home. These directives are harder to follow now than they used to be, because we no longer live in a culture that incentivizes perseverance in marriage. But it is still possible for individuals to go against the grain and insist on doing the harder, less fashionable thing. The critics of marriage are right to say that it has historically been used as a vehicle for the control of women by men, and they're right to point out that most marriages do not live up to a romantic ideal. They're right too that monogamous, lifelong marriage is in a sense unnatural, and that it is not the human norm. The marriage system that prevailed in the West up until recently was not perfect, nor was it easy for most people to conform to, since it demanded high levels of tolerance and self-control. Where the critics go wrong is in arguing that there is any better system. There isn't. Thank you.